the podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to the show. During this week's episode, I have the pleasure of chatting with Mike Scotland, who is the editor of Dive Log magazine. He's been diving since 1976, and as a dive pro, he taught over a thousand divers. A keen photographer and marine biologist, Mike has produced a large number of articles for resorts and operators throughout Australasia and now focuses on the content of the publication. Mike, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you. Cheers, buddy. Enjoy that beer. Um, and we, we can just talk about everything and anything that you've been up to, mate, especially dive log. All right. Well, I'll start off by um, going backwards. Um, <laughs> we, we dived on Monday with yeah. uh, Pro Dive Manly out there at Long Reef, and uh, we had 20 metres vis, and we had grey nurses, and it was sensational. 20 metres vis? Yeah, absolutely sensational. I think you've been a bit lucky there. There was loads of reports about all the um, bad viz over the last few weeks. Well, at the end of the dive, this really bad uh, dark water came in, but we, we got away with it. I dived on Saturday on the Tugra, and we had the same fantastic blue water, 20 metres of viz. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Happy days. Well, at least you're getting out in the water. Yeah. Did you get cold? No, the water's uh, uh, 20 degrees. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Cool beans. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit different to diving all over the tropics, though. Yeah, but the, the cold water is actually invigorating. It's, uh, it's, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel really good. <laughs> makes me feel like having a brew as soon as I get in. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's not that bad, is it? Not that bad. Um, we were out. Um, in fact, me and the missus did uh, Jervis Bay. Uh, not last weekend, weekend before. That was really nice. Met Sue from uh, Crest Diving. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she got some tanks for us. Lovely lady. And uh, I'm sure we'll have her on the podcast at some point. She seems to know that area so well. She's got some good stories to tell. Speaking of stories, let's, yep. uh, let's hear your story. Where, where did you start diving? Because it seems like you've been diving since, uh, you know, the evolution of man. I started to dive in... 1976 down in Cronulla, and um, I was pretty active. You know, absolutely loved it. Mm. I just remember every dive was just a knockout, and I dived a lot in Byron Bay, and it's just blow every dive would blow your mind. Just think big fish and big rays and all sorts of fantastic stuff. And um, so I became a, um, a diving instructor in 1982, and I taught a lot of divers. I taught. I know I taught a thousand divers, mm -hmm. but Paddy reckons I've only taught nine hundred and forty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they got their record, so I've got to go on them. Yeah, uh, but uh, it was good. I met a lot of people. You know, made a I made a, a bit of money, but um, spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of hours to make that money. But uh, you know, you don't make it to teach diving for money. You teach it because you've got a passion. Yeah, and I uh, I love to teach, so yeah, it was it was fun. Yeah. And I, I guess you're, you're no longer teaching, are you? Oh, it's it's hard work, as you know. I mean, you you know that. Uh, I mean, you're you're um, very experienced, and you know how you got to carry a lot of stuff, and you got to use your brain, and you got to be concentrate on. So as you get older and older, it just becomes too hard. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got, you 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 kind of develop that can't be asked kind of attitude as well, isn't it? Oh, well, here's a, here's another one to teach, or you can take your camera and go and do some photography. Well. I reckon I reckon the fifteen thousandth time I had to teach someone mask clearing, I had this guy and he refused to get it right. He said, mate, step one, step two, step three, got it? Yep. Here we go, he'd stuff it up. And after about ten goes, I thought, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> he just <laughs> could could not get on top of it, so I gave it away. Yeah. <laughs> as well as that I was gonna kill him. <laughs> It's not that hard, mate. <laughs> yeah, it isn't. It isn't. It's only watch and learn and copy and do, isn't it? Monkey see, monkey do. Mm, yeah. Oh, it must be easy. I'm doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's definitely true. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I love teaching diving. I actually tried to buy a dive shop a couple of times. Oh, yeah? And uh, I used to have a day job as a high school teacher. Which had you know a good salary and nice short hours and that, so I could teach diving at night and on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, I did ring up um, a very experienced dive instructor. 
And I said to him, um, I'm going to buy a dive shop. Can you give me some advice? He said, I'll tell you 10 reasons why you should not buy a dive shop. <laughs> and when he got to number four, I thought, I must have had rocks in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and he kept going. I thought, I would have lost my house, yeah. lost my wife, you know, got divorced, would have been broke, would have had no super. <laughs> 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 You'd have leathery old brown skin from being in the sun too long. Yeah. <laughs> I said to him about, I met him about 20 years later, and I said, oh, do you remember that conversation? He said, no. I said, well, that was a very important conversation for me. Mm. It really it was important because I had, I was going to jump into it, and you talked me out of it. And it saved me from making the biggest mistake of my life. Yeah. He said, oh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you kind of gave up on the idea of a, a, a dive centre. What what was the progression after that? I mean, what's well, the what's the story that leads us to what is Mike Scotland that we all know and love now? Well, I um, I I was a resident instructor at a dive shop in Cronulla for twelve years, and I used to get like the phone used to ring hot. I used to get people coming all over the place, and you know, like I taught over more than 100 divers a year for quite a few years, which is not bad when you're working full-time. Mm-hmm. Which which dive shop was it? Uh, it, was, it was called Miranda Dive. Is it still going? No, no, no. The guy closed. It got sold about 20-something years ago. And, ah. yeah. But, um, yeah, that no, was good. I I uh, uh, had, a, had a very good run with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, I got the occasional letter in the mail, uh, which I'd showed to my wife and said, Thanks for the Valentine's Day card. And she said, I didn't send that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was married before I became a diving instructor. Yeah, yeah. And occasionally uh, you get some friendly ladies who, uh, you know, um, send you a nice card, which is <laughs> this is all, all uh, but as I said, I was I was married, so I never went there for that sort of stuff. Good man. <laughs> Glad to hear it. <laughs> Not like all those instructors from Thailand. <laughs> yeah, party central. Uh, so then I um, I slowed down a bit, and then I started teaching marine biology because that's my passion. Mm. So I I ran a course with Patty called Marine Biology for Divers, and because um, I got a degree in in zoology and, and maths, so I decided to um, to use my university lecture notes to write up a course based on the photographs mm-hmm. uh, I'd been taking. So um, uh, when I wasn't instructing, I, I always had cameras. So I bought my first housing in 1978, mm-hmm. and I'm currently on my fourth housing. That's, that's not many housings for that longer period, well, is it? Yeah, but I've, I've still spent, I spent, you know, uh, it feels like a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> an awful lot of dice. That's just for the first one, eh? <laughs> a fil- film used to be, like, you go for a trip up the reef, you often take 22, 24 rolls of film. Mm. So and this, that, is, this is when it was rolls and yeah. you get, like, 36 shots per roll or something Yeah, like that. and that that had cost, like, in, in the year 1999, that had cost, um, you know, $700 for your film. Holy shit. For, for a, like, for a 10-day trip. Yeah. So it was big biggies. But I ended up, I built up a portfolio of photos and I thought I'll just put those into me. You know, I had a collection of like sea stars. Mm. So I did some research on sea stars and wrote a lecture on, like one of my favourite lectures of all is on sea urchins mm-hmm. and another one's on uh, flatworms. I, I can talk for an hour on flatworms. <laughs> <laughs> but no one can listen to <laughs> for more than a minute. <laughs> I've got to hold them down. <laughs> yeah. But there's an awful lot of really interesting marine biology mm-hmm. um, that you know I try because I'm I'm just a natural teacher, and I try to communicate. There are probably um, yeah, you know, there's a minority of divers who are really keen on marine biology. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's fifty percent, but it's you know possibly twenty thirty percent. Um, you reckon that low? I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of people are very busy, mm. but anyway. Um, I tried to communicate some, you know, some interesting things about marine life, and because uh, I just find it, um, I find it extremely fascinating that, like for example, a flatworm is the uh, the very first 
animal to have a left and a right side, so they're bilater- bilaterally symmetrical. Okay. So what that means is they can move. They can actually move forward, like left, right, left, right. Like we, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we all do for a living sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, they were the first animal to have internal reproduction, so they invented sex. So, and that's where it goes. That's why I can talk for an hour on marine biology of flatworms, because once you start talking about sex... <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of a theme going on here. I had Don Silcock on last week, and he was on about uh, well, cuttlefish and sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're getting smaller. <laughs> I said to people, it's, it's marine biology. You're allowed to talk about it. You're allowed to say these things. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I wrote this course, and I, I taught that. It was a five-day course, and I taught 19 of those. I taught it for, like, Dive 2000 and uh, Frog Dive and, you know, some of the big shops around Sydney, mm. Ocean Trek and... You know, um, but then um, when I had kids, I had to slow down because you know it was soccer and footy on the weekend and netball and yeah, you know. Uh, um, <clears throat> but once I'd paid for all my sins, uh, I uh, got back into doing a lot of writing and I re revised me. I spent about seven or eight months. Revising my marine biology course. It's very, very. It's got thousands of hours of research. It's very highly polished, mm. and I'm very proud of it. But um, uh, I found it too hard to market. Okay. So uh, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm I'm now running it in dive log. Mm-hmm. So I'm running the marine biology course in the magazine. And basically, what I'm doing is rewriting the, the lecture notes in dive log and just making it into a, a readable format. Okay. Uh, with the photographs. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the evolution of that side of things. Okay. And where did where did Divelog come into it? Because is, is it something that you've took on recently or have you been involved with it for a number of years? Uh, Barry Andrew Walther had sport diving. <clears throat> or he had, he, had, uh, he had a spearfishing magazine back in the 60s. Okay. And in the days when they used to go and they should kill everything that moves. <laughs> yeah, still do now, don't they? Uh, well, they had a photograph in there of uh, a hunt one day when they had, I think they got 400 um, uh, crayfish in one dive. Oh, dear. So when people dive now, they don't see any lobsters around Sydney. Yeah. They think it's normal. But what's actually normal, if you go back, say, 60 years, Mm. There should be uh, lobsters on every dive, and sometimes ten or twenty lobsters. That's normal. Yeah. But we get used to what's, you know, what's left after they've all been taken. Uh, and unfortunately, with diving, there's a lot of marine life that's actually not, not. Um, you, you know, you go diving. Oh, yeah, it was a nice dive. Really enjoyed that. But you don't see what's not there. What should be there. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, it's just like a blank. If you like, yeah, yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. So, your man there had the Spearows magazine, and did he develop dive log? So he went to sport diving as Barry. Yep. Uh, I think in the early seventies, mm-hmm. and that was a very successful magazine, very famous. And uh, I started writing for it in about nineteen eighty five. Mm. 1984, I think it was, and I was, I was uh, very active then. That was before kids, <laughs> yeah. And it was brilliant. I remember being in Tassie in 1986, it was, I think, and I went to a news agent in the middle of nowhere, and there was a magazine with my article in it. And at the time, there were three dive magazines in Australia, yeah. And there were three magazines in this little news agent, you know, 100 miles from Hobart, and I had an article in the three magazines at one wow. time. But that was a good buzz, eh? And that was a buzz. And that's really, that's really the addiction that got me going because when you see your photograph in print, it's really exciting. It's really enjoyable to say, oh, that's, look, I'm in print. <laughs> or I'm on, <laughs> online, yeah, look at that. <laughs> and it's addictive. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the other side of it is, uh, you know, Barry, Barry started dive logging about, 
oh, about 35 years ago, about 90, the mid-1980s, I think it was. Okay. And there was a dive magazine before that called In Depth, mm-hmm. and I'd written a bit for him. And uh, I remember Barry ringing up and saying, oh, what's this magazine like? And next thing he started his own magazine. But what happened back then is that if you see an old uh, dive log mm-hmm. or a sport diving, it had hundreds and hundreds of ads and there were hundreds of dive shops, hundreds of dive boats. Mm-hmm. The dive industry was on fire. Yeah. It was probably, uh, I think a lot of people would agree, it's probably three to five times bigger than what it is now. Really? But there were 52 dive shops in Sydney. What? And now there's like 13, I think. Bloody hell. Maybe 14. Yeah, yeah. And diving was, was really, really huge. Um, and um, so Barry, Barry used to have fantastic support from the dive industry. And then... Uh, you know, uh, he, he used to bring people out from overseas like uh, Cousteau's and Dubois, all those really famous people to all the, he had these big dive shows. Mm-hmm. So Barry was a real entrepreneur and did, you know, did a lot of huge, huge like diving events where yeah. they'd get, like I went to Melbourne in 1997 and they had like thousands of people, just thousands of people every day mm. and a really successful show mm. and now you go to a dive show and you know it's uh, it's not as big as it used to be well look that um just backing it up a little bit um mike and i first met when i was working out in Papua new guinea at two feet and he came to do some photography in 2017 and the next time i saw him was 2018 at the sydney dive show and you were doing a bit on stage um, just after Don McFadden, and it was it, it, it's kind of engulfed by the the boat show. Yeah, well, they um, like that that particular dive show was um, is uh, the people who run it are very dedicated, and they're trying really hard to get it up and running. Mm, mm. But there's a lot of reasons why people can't. Get involved. I think it's a lot to do with the family, work, you know, money pressures of society today. It's very yeah. hard to, you know, you can buy a little house for a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard to afford to go diving after that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so then I got I started writing for Divelog in the 1985 mm-hmm. uh, and sport diving and also scuba diving magazine. And uh, under underwater with Neville Coleman, mm-hmm. and then um, uh, I started having a family in eighty seven and eighty eight, and that mm-hmm. slowed me down a fair bit. But I still ran, you know, some dive courses and stuff. And then, um, but I always had a passion for for for, for writing and for um, marine biology and for uh, photography. And. What you took? You took on dive log, or uh, no? I, I used to write a lot of articles. I did. Um, I did. Um, I can't remember exactly how many articles I did. I did quite a lot of articles for those magazines, and then yeah. um, as I Barry Barry's, I'm pretty sure he turns eighty this year, and when he hit seventy eight, he just said, "Oh, I'm too old for this." So, um, luckily for him, a uh, a sort of a a lunatic came along who was prepared to work for nothing <laughs> <laughs> and try to float a sinking boat. <laughs> that was me. That's why your hair's gone grey, isn't it, in the last two years? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a passion, and I like I I think I became. It's probably safe to say I became the major writer for di- for dive log hmm. over the last few years because I was often writing, you know, twelve, ten, twelve pages hmm. in each issue. And uh, Barry was kind enough just to give it to me. He just said, really? oh, look, I think he said, he didn't actually say this to me personally, but I think he thought, well, this is the right bloke for the job. So, mm. so here's, here it is. Hats off to Barry then. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 What a privilege. <laughs> what a privilege. Well, it is because yeah. he's, um, I did say, to, uh, did say to some people that he's been doing it for over 55 years. Mm. And he's one of the most experienced 
divers and publishers in the world. Mm. He's really been around. He's done some hard yards. Yeah. And uh, he's got a wealth of experience. <laughs> Just tell <laughs> me. Get out while you can. <laughs> I ignored him. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair play. But I suppose I mean you've been writing a long time now, so I think with the way society's gone now, it's going digital, and you know, in the eighties and nineties, everybody had a magazine of some sort that you would get on a weekly basis, and I can even remember as a kid subscribing to get a weekly magazine, whether that's crime or sport or whatever. And then nowadays it's it's all digital and and Instagram and I, I should imagine that the the news agents kind of struggle. Yeah, tough game being a news agent. Yeah, mm. um, but people are fighting back. Like I know, I know the um, uh, I know some of the big media companies are trying to get back into print and. They reckon there's a market there. People want to hold a magazine in their hand and read it. Mm. Um, I I did have something to do with um, the bloke who owns Channel 7 and owns a lot of papers in WA. Mm. And I think I think they're fighting back with – they own a lot of magazines. Like, um, I think his name's Stokes. But anyway, he, um, I think he's fighting back to try and get Claw back into the market. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think people want to people want to be able to buy a Women's Weekly and look at a nice, you know, bunch of flowers or a hat or something or other or a nice recipe or something. So mm, mm. they think there's a market there. Yeah. So I, with, I like the, I like the way that you mentioned Women's Weekly. You know, is that a personal favourite? <laughs> I uh, I think I think it's one of his magazines, uh, Kerry Stokes. But um, anyway, I don't know him, but um, um. No, I uh, I I do read Women's Weekly because um, to get in touch with my feminine side. <laughs> and the other thing I do is I take women's vitamin pills. <laughs> Mate, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with taking vitamin pills. Yeah, but women's ones are you know, they seem to do the trick. Oh right, okay. That's that's why that's why the hair's growing longer. Then it's not COVID and lockdown <laughs> and not going to the barbers. <laughs> oh, good on you. Good on you. So um, I mean. We've got to point out as well that um, Divelog magazine, you have um, uh, a, a counterpart that, that helps you out with the production of this. Uh... Uh, Vicky, Vicky's our graphic artist. She lives in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. We've never met. Really? We've spoken on the phone hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. She's an absolutely wonderful person. And um, she... Um, uh, she does all the hard yakka, I get all the glory. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but she's a, she's a gem, and you know, she um, she's dedicated. And um, my hope for her is that I can um, afford to pay her a proper wage mm. one day. At the moment, she's um, she's working for peanuts, and um, I'm so grateful that she's she's uh, showing such loyalty. Yeah, but uh, we're we, you know, we're going to try and just get more more support from the dive industry because. A lot of people say there's a definite need for you know for dive magazine, and it's a it's a tradition. It's been around for well, with sport diving for you know, over forty years. So mm. there are a lot of loyal, long term, you know, readers that uh, want to see it going. Mm. Mm. Well, the thing is, I mean, you, you look at, um, I mean, I obviously I get it every month, and I look forward to it because it's not just a a little magazine it's i mean the last one was what 112 pages and you've got content there which is yourself with the marine biology articles and then the amount of writers that you've got on all sorts of topics to do with diving is is truly magnificent well we're very lucky to have a, a really good group of people who are keen to write some very passionate dedicated people mm. And it's just solid gold. Like we've got, like David Mullins is a an expert on nudie branks, and he's got a, a superb column, mm. and uh, he he's as reliable as can be, and he, his quality is always excellent, mm. and always a really interesting read. Uh, we've got Nigel Marsh, who's um, 
possibly Australia's most published underwater photographer. You reckon? Yeah. Oh, I, think, yeah. I think there's a few people who want to have a go at that one. <laughs> well, no, he's he's been around a long time. He's got, yeah. he's got a dozen of books. Yeah, he's he's got a lot of stuff published. He's got he's been writing for dive magazines for over thirty years. So, yeah. I think, who, who's going to who who have you got in mind? I seem to come across a lot of um, highly experienced divers in this part of the world. So I've not uh, not got anyone in particular in mind, but I know there's a lot that would love to have that title. Well, but he's got the runs on the board, so he's got he's got I don't know at least. 300 articles published and Bloody hell. lots of front covers. He's very prolific, yeah. Yeah. He's a bit, he's a very humble sort of guy. He's a bit understated. Yeah. Um, he doesn't go around blowing his own trumpet very much, but he's certainly, I'd, I'd, I'd go back and I'd say that, you know, I'd like to find out who's had more stuff published than Nigel. He's, yeah. But anyway, he's, he's very loyal uh, and he does good quality work all the time. Yeah. And I've got stacks of people um, who are really keen to have their say, and um, it it makes the magazine look good when you've got a lot of content. Like I've got um, I've got a, a guy called Peter Fields who has got an article um, in the current issue. Mm-hmm. They he was from Auckland originally. Mm-hmm. He's he's eighty six years of age. Still saw him diving in the tugger on. Or out on the Tugger last Saturday. Oh, yeah? Driving his boat. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. They sailed from Auckland in 1971 across the Terra del Fuego in oh, a yacht. Oh, right. really? Yeah. Okay. They dived Terra del Fuego. He, he's sure, or fairly sure, he's the first person on planet Earth to dive that the tip of Southern America. Yeah. Then they sailed across to off Chile to Robinson Crusoe Island. Um, because there was a a young Scotsman uh, stranded there for three years in seventeen hundred and five. Okay, and when he got back to Scotland, he told Daniel Defoe the story, and Daniel Defoe wrote the book Robinson Crusoe ah. based on his experience. Anyway, um, I love this story. Yeah. Um, in World War One, in nineteen fourteen, the Germans were fairly um, uh, prominent. In the waters off South America, they had naval boats there, hmm. and they sunk some British ships at the end of 1914. Mm-hmm. So the Brits were just developing the superior naval power, so they sent down some of their big boppers down there. Hmm. I can't remember the names of the big British naval boats, but they went down there and they they fought the Battle of the Falklands in 1915, mm-hmm. and they sunk a lot of German boats including the one that was captained by Admiral Spee, you know, from the from the famous Graf Spee boat from World War Two. Yeah. So Admiral Spee was the admiral in charge of that particular German fleet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one German boat escaped called the Dresden, and they sailed all the way around South America up to Chile, and they anchored at Robinson Crusoe Island, and the British boats caught up with them, mm-hmm. and they had them trapped, and then they um, the captain of the German boat, Got his crew off and surrendered yeah. with a white flag, and then saved the crew, and then scuttled the boat yeah. in two hundred feet of water. So Peter went and dived this boat. Oh dear! And like in nineteen seventy one, I'm thinking like <laughs> it's a fantastic story. Yeah. Anyway, dive logs full of really good stories that are really good reading. Um, little little gems like that that are mm. just like adventures of a lifetime. Mm. Yeah. And it's like you say, it's it's all everyday people that um, that are willing to, you know, put time and effort into writing these articles, and it's it's a nice collection. Well, he, he's he's an everyday person, but he's certainly done a lot in the dive industry. Mm. He's done all. Yeah, you know, he's been. He was a scuba pro rep for Australia. Yep. His own commercial diving in Auckland and dive shops and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, he's a. Um, He's a he's a giant in the dive industry in his own way. Yeah. Um, but you know uh, he's got a stack of stories. And anyway, back to me. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's it's so fantastic for me to have a guy like him who can tell all these amazing stories. And I ring him up and say, "He said, yeah, I've got another story for you.'" <laughs> he says, "Oh, that's a pearl." <laughs> 
<laughs> and he, he said, I've got plenty more. Yeah. <laughs> He's got some really good stories. And they just keep coming. And, you know, I'm, I'm tickled pink because, um, you know, it, it, people like him are a great resource mm. and they provide really good entertainment and, um, and learning for, for readers. Yeah, yeah. A, a good promotion for the sport. Yeah. And his story in the next issue is a, another absolute ripper. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's a really good story uh, um, about a, a dive day in 1972 when um, they used to spear fish on scuba in in New Zealand in those days and also in Australia yep. before it was banned. And um, he went down and speared a huge fish at 130 feet and there were seven dive clubs and, you know, 75 divers there. Hmm. And when they saw this giant fish, they all thought, oh, we're going to beat that. So one of the guys dived down and had to go deeper and deeper and deeper. And he had a plan to meet his brother at, a, at a, about 80 feet uh-huh. for a spare tank and a deco stage tanks. Yeah. And um, there was a few problems developed in the area. The guy got the bends and ended up dying. I well, got a... They reckon he went to 300 feet. Oh, dear. They said on the day that his, and he just, his blood turned to like a milkshake. You know? Yeah. But it's a good story because it's got a lot of learning in it, a lot of mm-hmm. really good lessons for divers. Mm. And, uh, yeah. And you have, um, there's the, 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 the little tasters as well, isn't there? There's like the, um, what's it called? The, uh, the parting shot. And people can submit photos to get them displayed in the magazine. The parting shot is to try and get uh, really nice photographs published. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're trying to um, – we have an ulterior motive. We're trying to get um, <coughs> uh, more people to send in material because the more people we get in, the better the magazine's going to look. Mm-hmm. And if – like, say, for example, when you sent in your letter to the editor a few months ago mm-hmm. – um, the, the, hopefully you, you shared it with your friends so you know oh, we yeah. expanded our readership and that's kind of like the one of the the benefits yeah um but uh yeah we, it's also good to have um people who've never been in print mm. like we've got a guy in the next magazine who is a very good photographer he's from sydney from actually up here somewhere do you want and, to give him a shout out what's his name Steve, Steve Coots. Steve, I know, I know nice, Steve Coots, yeah. Nice photo. Yeah. Mate, why, are you, why are you hiding all your stuff in, at home? Like, get, it, yeah. get it out there, you know. Like, and I think, um, you know, like there's plenty of people like him who've got really good stuff mm. and they should share it around. So, we, you know, we try and expand our readership. We try and get people um, – it's like it's – like, um, I've never tried heroin, but apparently they say it's it's like going to heaven. <laughs> but when you get a, um, when you get a photograph of your dog, like oh that was fun, you know, I'll do it again. <laughs> so that's the theory. Yeah. Oh, why not? Well, there's plenty of space in the magazine, isn't there? Well, that's it. I mean, um, it's only a bit of extra work mm. to put an extra page in, and um, but what we're doing the 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 philosophy behind the magazine. Uh, is we're going to make every magazine a blockbuster mm-hmm. and we're going to try and strive for excellence in photography and in cover all aspects of diving and uh, try and you know get our readers to look forward to the next issue. Like So the next issue is coming out uh, on the 1st of June or probably the day before. Mm-hmm. So we want people to say, oh, look, you know, I'm really looking forward to dive. Like, it's a great read and tell all their mates because um, – as you said, it's it's chock full of really good reading. We try and cover photography and nudie branks and adventure stuff and marine biology and uh, you know we try and cover every state in Australia and mm. dive travel and you know, make it a, a magazine for all divers. So it's it's a really good read. Yeah, yeah, and it's it, it's nice just to receive it in the in the email inbox, isn't it? Well, you know, it, it breaks up all the monotony. Well, I'm talking about mine now, but it breaks up the monotony of getting all the crap coming through the emails. And you see that one come through. Oh, something I actually want to look at. I could do that with Facebook. <laughs> you could yeah. spend 50 bucks a day yeah. for 50 days and they'd be tickled pink. Yeah. But ultimately, they send it to, you know, Joe Bloggs in, you know, 
50 different countries and you try and you can control where they send it to to a degree mm. but the best way for people to get dive log is to sign up for it and get it delivered to their mailbox yeah because um you know like uh, i don't really want to say anything negative about facebook but um i'll just <laughs> It's all right. You can say what you want on this show, mate. <laughs> I just say that you've got to keep paying. It. But it's better to, better for people to sign up because then it goes direct to your mailbox. And then we do have a mailing list and it's it's just direct. Hmm. Um, and um, so we, you know, because we, we, we pay a subscription for Facebook, we pay a subscription for the, the mail out hmm. and we pay another subscription for the the flipping book, you know, that when you can see it online and the pages flip. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, the best way is for people to actually sign up and, and have it delivered to their to their mailbox because then we can we actually know we've got a real reader. Yeah. If we get you know unfortunately we've got a you know Abdullah from Tanganyika, mm. and I think well should I contact this guy directly and ask him if he's a diver, or he just happened to come across us on social media by fluke. Mm. So um, you don't know who you who your readers actually are. Yeah, yeah. But if you have a direct mail out, you know that they're a real person. So Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um are you are you allowed to say how many kind of readers you've got, roughly? Um You don't have to. No, I've got I think it's seventeen. Seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, when I started out <laughs> once a year someone say, Oh, I saw your article in Dive Log. And and then it got to twice a year, and I was talking to Kevin Deacon about four years ago. And he said, "Oh yeah, I read Dive Log every month. I, I love it." He said, "I you know look forward to coming out." And I said, "You're my thirteenth reader." <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, I contact a lot of dive shops direct, mm. a lot of dive clubs. I ask them to share with their readers. A lot of the contributors share with their their groups. Um, we have we do some paid marketing, so the honest to goodness truth is that um, I don't really know. It's yeah. probably in the tens of thousands, but it's like it's like you know I want to write, I want to take photographs, I want to go diving. Mm-hmm. I'm not particularly interested in uh, you know internet research. You know, what I mean, it's sort of it's an area that, that I've got to look look at, but it's yeah. sort of like it's kind of like asking a a plumber to fly a plane. You know, he said, "Well, I'm not really, yeah. it's not really my area of expertise, type of thing." Yeah. So, um, I think we've got a fantastic support base. Uh, I, I don't know what the numbers are. Hmm. And the other problem I think is that you can do a count. Apparently, you can do a count on iPad. You can do a count on iPhones. Mm-hmm. You can do a count on Android phones. Mm-hmm. You can do a count on laptops. And I don't. I think they're all independent. So mm. it's one of those IT skills that you need. You need to go and pay someone, yeah, you know, a few thousand dollars to do all that, yeah, analysis for you, and that's just not not affordable. Yeah. So the short answer is, <clears throat> don't know. Yeah, that's fair enough. I kind of um, I get I get lost in all that digital stuff as well. I mean, this is obviously a stream and it's online and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was only a couple of months ago that I learned how to. You know, kind of get a rough estimate on downloads. Oh, clueless. Yeah. Uh, we're building a new website at the moment, but I'm no good with that either. So I've got a good mate of mine who's doing it for me. Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, you need, you need, uh, it's like diving. If you want to find uh, good marine life, you dive with someone with good eyesight and they show you where it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of diving, um, on the way over to the studio here, you were mentioning Fiji and, um, you know, You've been there once or twice. I've been. I've done twelve trips to Fiji. Yeah. I spent about twenty nine weeks there diving, all, all dive resorts. Yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of dough, <laughs> probably seventy five grand in Fiji. So oh bloody hell! I single handedly fixed up the economy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I love Fiji. I love the people. Yeah. Uh, I, I played a lot of rugby, so mm. when you go to a dive. Uh, like an island with the diving there. Hmm. As soon as you mention rugby, oh yeah, yeah, I played. You know, where'd you play? You know, yeah. I was in the second row. So you off you go. You're having a great time, and yeah, you know, you're instant friends. Yeah, 
Um, and um, the Fijian people are just wonderful. They're absolutely very friendly, very, very genuine people. Mm. Yeah, I, I love going there, yeah. And you, you're planning to go back again at some point once all this COVID malarkey? Yeah, I've, I've, I'm actually, uh, I was going to go last year, but we had to cancel because of the the pandemic. Um mm. But uh, yeah, I've been I've been to uh, the Yasawas, the um, the Marmanuthas, Kandavu. Uh, been to um, the Samo Samo Strait to Taviuni. I've been done a few liverboards there. So I actually probably know more about Fiji mm. than most travel agents, <laughs> and that's probably probably that's, a fair statement. Yeah, you know, because I've been I've had a pretty good look around. Mm. And I've, I've been to a lot of resorts, and I, you know, I've done the diving, so I actually have a good knowledge. Did you do? Did, did you do? You know, like you did with Tufi, you know, share the photography that you're doing, and and write any articles for for the resorts there, or? Yeah, well, you know, being a writer holic, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I wrote articles for Volley Volley and Octopus Resort, and um, uh, some down in Kandavu, and for um, for Taviuni and. Uh, Dolphin Resort, mm. and uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of writing, done a lot of writing for the lure boards there. I, I did a few trips on, two trips on the Fiji Siren, mm. uh, which were fantastic trips. Yeah, but unfortunately, it had a close encounter with a rock and a few years ago, and uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's on the bottom of the. Samo Samo Sea somewhere. So, ooh, is it deep or is it a new 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 wreck we can dive? Oh, it's deep here. It's yeah, thousands of. Oh, long gone. I think certainly at least a thousand feet. I think I'm not sure of it. Yeah, but it was it was great. Yeah. Um, so there are some excellent dives in Fiji, um, and uh, lots of lots of resorts. Yeah. Well, I've done a lot of diving in the Barrier Reef. I've actually done forty. 46 trips to the Barrier Reef, 46 dive trips, um, with about with more than 400 diving days on the reef. So I've dived all the way from Great Detached Reef up the north yeah. to Lord Howe and done lots of trips to everywhere, you know, the Capricorn Bunkers and um, the Ribbon Reefs and Osprey Reef, Bougainville Reef. Yeah. So I've, I've done a lot of diving yeah. on the Barrier Reef. Because I'm, I'm slightly ashamed of myself. I've been here three years and I've not been there yet. It's uh, it's got uh, you know a great experience. It's had a lot of bad publicity, but uh, mm. I've never really believed a lot of that sort of stuff. I've always thought that the 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 Barrier Reef has been smashed by cyclones for thousands of years, mm. and the one thing about it is got phenomenal powers of regeneration and regrowth. When people talk about oh the end of the end of the Barrier Reef, you know the crown of thorns are going to eat it all, I thought well no, it's famous for regrowth, it's famous for regeneration, yeah. rebirth, you know, restoring itself, and um, it's it's one of the great things about the Barrier Reef is it's really good at recovering from massive uh, environmental disasters. Yeah. And I assume that you've done the other side as well. You've been over to Ningaloo. No. Have you not? No, never been there, no. Bloody hell. Um I did most most of my diving on the on the um the one fifty one Meridian, so that's the Barrier Reef, Sydney, New Guinea, truck, uh and uh so just on that sort of single uh longitude, Meridian yeah. longitude that uh and then I've also branched out because Fiji is sort of not far away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little. <laughs> and the Solomon done a lot of diving in the Solomons. Yeah, and a lot in Indonesia as well. But uh, so um, was mostly the, on the east coast of Australia. Yeah, was the um, sorry to interject there, but uh, Solomons? Did you do resorts or was that through Shaz's Liverboard? Ah, uh, I've done the Billy Kiki twice and the. Tacker twice mm -hmm. for ten days each, and um, I've done a few resorts. And um, so, I mean, the Solomons is a is a a really good place to dive. Mm. It's got all the World War Two wrecks and lots of planes, and um, it's probably like Fiji was 
maybe 60 to 80 years ago. Really? Yeah, it's quite, it's, but the like everywhere you go, um, the people are, if you treat them well, they're very friendly and they're very, you know, you can get on very well with them. Mm. Um, I've, I've found it, you know, in New Guinea, I found the people there go out of their way to help you and they're very friendly. Yeah. And uh, if you respect them, they, they'll give you the, they'll give you the world yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the Barry Roof's been a, you know, a pilgrimage. In fact, I, I say to people, um, you're not a real diver if you don't go to the reef once a year. Oh. <laughs> it's upsets just, people. Just, just drive that into me, why don't you? <laughs> yeah, just nail it into your head. Uh, it's just a, just sort of like I try and get there as often as I can because it's such a good spot. Yeah. Um, so we're going up. Actually, we're going up with with, with uh, Michael McFadgen on. I'm organising that trip in October. We're going oh, yeah. to dive the Yongala and the reefs around Townsville. Mm. And, you know, the reefs around Townsville have, have got great fish life and, you know, uh, some, some spectacular diving. Mm. And we go on, on a boat called the Kalinda, and it's a it's a it's run by Dave uh, Stewart. And Dave's like. Um, He's, in his own way, he's a legend because he, he will go out of his way to put you on the best dives. Yeah. The boat's, you know, a little bit old, but, you know, he, he provides a good service and um, at, at the right price and he provides outstanding diving. That's what you're there for, isn't it? So I've done uh, three trips with him up to Rain Island mm-hmm. and uh, uh, four other trips up to the Yongala and uh, the Reefs of Townsville. Mm-hmm. So, so we're doing it again in October, and uh, that'll be good. Yeah, six days. So how, how far offshore is it? Uh, uh, it's only twelve nautical miles. Okay, but we go out as far as um, seventy. We go out to like Anzac Reef. Yeah, and the reefs out there are um, are good if you know the spots. There's some. Um, we've had some cracker dives there. Mm. Uh, we had a, a night dive at Anzac Reef about six years ago, and. Um, we jumped in and the current was about two knots and everyone else pulled out. And we thought the current got down to the reef mm. and had a stunning dive. You know, lobsters and bloody big fish and, you know, it got in behind the reef. It was calm as can be. Yeah. It was one of the best dives I've ever had. <laughs> you, should have, you should have just gone, just dropped to the bottom and crawled along the bottom. It was great. Yeah. And we've done night dives on the Ongala, which is pretty special. Um, That's serious adrenaline diving, serious advanced diving. Yeah. Uh, especially the last time we did, we'd had very strong current. Uh, we used a third of the tank getting from the boat to the shot line. We had a, had a, like a, a line from the boat on the shore, on, on the surface, to the drop line, okay. then down the drop line, and then got behind the wreck. And that took us like a third of the tank it's really hard work. I probably so, just um, just to explain to everyone who's listening, the, the Yongala, it's it's actually very difficult to get the right conditions to dive this location, isn't it? Yeah. And is it mainly because of the currents, or is it swell and? It's and very weather? exposed. It gets big swells, strong currents, and there's no protection. Right. So you can often go there and not dive. But um, anyway, we got down there. Saw the biggest turtles you ever seen. Like probably. Uh, Huge green turtles, yeah. Um, huge loggerhead turtles, and then we're on the on the hull. I saw a baby um, Queensland cod, about a metre. <laughs> and the next day, I saw a teenage one about two metres, oh. and I've seen the big one, which is about three metres. Oh the hell! And then we had a bronze whaler come flying past in the torch beam. Yeah, at like. 100 miles an hour, and they would be swimming, I don't know, you guess it, 30 times, 40 times faster than we can swim. Oh, yeah. Well, they go, they go, don't they? And they are spectacular. Yeah. Whew, whew. And was it the the fact that you were there that was attracting them, or they were after um, bait being it, that were attracted to the lights? Or I think it's just a, there's so much fish life there that um, the, the marine light comes in. There's all sorts of stuff. Has been seen there. If you had a tally of the marine life, mm. it'd be, um, you know, as long as the Bible type of thing. Yeah. Uh, 
But anyway, that was that was an exhilarating dive. We came back up. You know, we only got like ninety minutes on the bottom, hmm. and we came back up and just sort of thought that was mind blowing. It's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <That's> mind blowing. <laughs> Fantastic. And um, have have you done? Um, well, I assume you've done them so far already. The uh, Stradbroke Island. No, no, I haven't done that. I um, haven't done much in South Queensland. Okay. I've done a lot of diving in the Capricorn bunkers from Bundaberg, mm-hmm. uh, but not between Bundaberg and Brisbane. Okay. Well, if you end up wanting to do Straddy, I've got a contact up there. I'm going to get him on the podcast. He's so hyperactive and passionate about diving, it's ridiculous. And he's, yeah. he's just putting up these constant streams of amazing videos and photos of what's up there. It looks fantastic. I really want to go there. Um, I, I've just been up at Byron Bay mm-hmm. and uh, with all the leopard sharks. Mm. And also at Woolai North Solitary with Stan. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we've got some nice leopard shark photos. In fact, there's a leopard shark article in the next dive log. Okay. And uh, they are, as you probably know, they are the most beautiful shark. Mm. Very inquisitive and uh, very photogenic. Mm. Is the, um, there was a, um, a doctor that was, um, collating ID information on leopard sharks. I think she was out of Newcastle University. I think she started Spot the Leopard Shark in Thailand. I can't remember her name at the moment. But there's, it was definitely, um, I, yeah, I'm sure it was Newcastle University. Um, I bet the lady who's doing the, um, the smooth stingray. Research. Um, trying to learn that too. So we've got the world's biggest stingray. We have. Yeah. Which the, one? The smooth stingray, the Is short it? tail stingray. Yeah. That's Back the world's in, biggest. Well, there's actually about. If you Google world's biggest stingray, yeah, you get about six. You get, there's one in like Mexico and America and Africa and stuff, hmm. and our one. So they're all they grow to two point. One to two point three, two point four meters, but it's one of the ones in the same group. Uh, so you're diving in Sydney, like we've seen them lots of times at uh, Cornell. Yeah, you're in the water there, and there's great big. I'm photographing a nudie back or something, and I've seen this big shadow. Look up half a meter away. There's this one and a half meter wide short tail stingray. Yeah, coming out and say, "What's he doing?" <laughs> <laughs> What are you looking at? Show me what you're looking at. Yeah. And that's the world's biggest stingray. And you think, how special is that? Right, you know, the city of five million people. And this is in Cornell? Yeah. Bloody hell. And this is one of the things I like to to write about is that um, when you look at our sea stars, well, we've got the most beautiful, colourful sea stars mm. in Sydney that are just superb. They're very photogenic, like the Velvet Sea Star and the Vermilion Brick Sea Star. Mm. bright colours and stunning photography. Um, I've never seen anywhere in the world with a better collection of sea stars. And then you start moving on and you think, well, leather jackets. I'm into leather jackets. We've got, I think I counted 15 species at one stage. And we have... So leather jackets, just for those that don't know what a leather jacket is? Well, Americans call them file fish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we've got more than half the world species. And they're amazing because some of them are identical yeah. sexes. Here we are, back to sex again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them are spectacularly different. Like the most beautiful one, which is probably the most common one, is the six spine leather jacket. It looks like it's got a sunrise on its side. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the male is is spectacular and beautiful, like mm-hmm. the peacocks. <clears throat> and they dig a little hole in like a nest in the sand and they attract the female and she comes along and lays the eggs in the in the hole mm-hmm. and he fertilizes them. Anyway, I got in touch with a guy from Auckland, a, an Italian guy doing a PhD. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think his name was Vitalini, Vitalini. And he was researching leather jackets and he found out that they they stop breeding now, like probably March, mm-hmm. and they don't they don't mate between, say, February, March, April, May, and they start mating late June. 
and then they made June through till February, and they made about once every five to seven days. Okay. So what they do is they produce a small number of eggs, yeah. fertilise them, yeah. uh, over a period of maybe 36 to 38 weeks. So there's ongoing babies. Constant turnover. Constant turnover. Yeah. And it's a really good strategy for spreading your you know, your, your reproductive mm. energy around. And I, you know, I, so I look around, there's um, stars and stripes leather jackets, there's... Um, uh, Toothbrush leather jackets, which is unbelievable. Do you know them? They're not sure. They're a little green one, but the male's got a big brush thing on its tail. Okay. Don't call. Um, and there's just some really beautiful leatheries. Um, and we've got, as I said, we've got the world's the world's biodiversity hotspot. And same goes for pipefish. I just hold on. Uh, yeah, so the leather jackets. I'm just thinking back to you know I mentioned that we went to Jervis Bay. Um, yeah, so the just have a look here. Uh, I can't even pronounce that. Hold on, I'm sure you can. Can you see that from there? That's the Chinaman. Yeah, those dudes. Um, I don't know what it was about the misses. But um, they followed her around the entire dive site for the entire dive. There was, there was at least 60 of them. Yeah, they're a piece of those things, yeah. They're a pain in the ass, aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what's well, the – I mean, the the ocean is really out of balance. It's like it, – it's actually – if you're if you're a bit aware of marine biology, hmm. it's actually a bit saddening because you look at the ocean and you think – like, put this way, I was, I was at Jarvis Bay two years ago hmm. and I said to the people I was diving with, we went there for a week, I said, oh – there's no fish life here. Like, you know, and they said, oh, you're joking. There's fish everywhere. I said, well, you know, I dived here 40 years ago, mm. and there was much, much more fish life. There's just too many fish are just, are just not there. Mm. And people work from a, a base point. Like, say you learn to dive in 2020, then that's your base point. And yeah. you go, oh, well, I can see a leather jacket. And, but if you learn to dive in 1970-something, yeah, then you think, well, no, we used to see – Lots more stuff. Yeah. And uh, your baseline is different and you realise that the ocean is under a lot of pressure. And then you read that, um, you know, there's overfishing and stuff going on and you kind of think, well, you know, we really do need to have marine parks and try and help Mother Nature to restore the the marine life because the diving in Sydney is wonderful. Mm. We have a superb marine life, but it should be a lot better. Mm. If if we're able to have some protection for it, yeah. I mean, they, they do try, don't they? But I don't think there's enough. Um, there's not enough emphasis on the the, the most the word the, the protection, the follow up. So this this is the heart of the problem. Like, there's seven hundred thousand fishermen registered in New South Wales, mm. and they want to go out, they work their butt off all week long, mm-hmm. or go out on a weekend, have a day in the fresh air, catch a feed. Go home and feel good. Yeah, you know it's their reward, and they have a right to. You know, it's a natural instinct to go hunting. Mm. I personally think that the fishery should get more of the fisheries money, uh, produce more fish breeding stations, release more brim, snapper, jewfish, mm-hmm. uh, mulloway, you know, you know, well, you know uh, anything uh, like drama, and restock the sea so everyone can go and enjoy themselves. That's that's my argument. Mm. My argument is that you know. We're all there to enjoy the sea. This, you know, we just need to to restock it so everyone's happy. Yeah. Rather than, you know, I don't really want to. But there's no nothing to be gained by picking fights with fishermen saying, oh, "I'm going to ban you guys from the ocean." That's just that's just dumb. Yeah, but then there is the argument though to have areas that are protected from fishing, so that at least you've got a little bit of respite for the wildlife that's in there. Well, if I was a dictator of Australia. Hmm. Which I'm currently working on. <laughs> <laughs> I would I would divide New South Wales from the Gold Coast down to the Victorian border yeah. into five kilometre lots, zone A, zone B, uh-huh. and I'd have zone A every second five kilometre lots a fishing zone for five years, yep. and zone B is a protected zone. Yes, and I would think what would happen is that within probably ten years, the amount of fish life in the ocean would go up by tenfold. 
mm-hmm. and the fishermen would be so happy and the divers would be so happy because the ocean would be rich as it should be. Yeah. And that's, yeah. you know, uh, that's the, the thing that's hard to do because people don't want to close off their favourite fishing area because that's the only place they can go and find a fish. And But, you know, you need a dictator. That's when a dictatorship will work. Yeah. Whereas a democracy fails because uh, there's a few thousand divers and there's 700,000 fishermen. So mm. um, the Shooter and Fishers Party, you know, they, they have a disproportionate amount of power. But anyway, getting away from politics, <laughs> we all have a right to enjoy the sea and there should be more fish in there. We can do it. We can just breed them up and mm. provide some protection and then make everyone be able to enjoy the ocean. Yeah. And it, there's proof it does work because that idea that you just said about along the coast of New South Wales is actually, is it Philippines where they did that years ago? And they they rotate the locations that fishermen can go. And it has been very successful. Have you been to Tubataha? I've not, no. Me neither. I've heard that's been protected for 30 years and it's yeah. now the best diving in the Philippines. Yeah. I've heard it's spectacular. Yeah. So I would like to go there one day. It's definitely on the bucket list yeah. for that very reason. Me too, yeah. So the sea, the sea could be just like Komodo mm. is a stunning place. But um, I got involved with Josh Pett and um, Valerie Taylor's nephew, um, Mark Hayes, mm. and they fought to get K- Komodo a marine park mm-hmm. um, to protect it from fishing and dynamite and all the rest of the stuff. Yeah, and now it's a, it's one of the world's gems of diving. But it's always under constant threat from fishermen. They want to go in there and clean up all the fish. But there's more money in tourism. Um, and if we did that all around the world, um, the you know the diving would be a lot better and the spillover would allow fishermen to get a lot more fish. And mm. Did you watch um, – do you want another beer? Are you done? Yeah. You want another one? Yeah. I'll go and get them. Hold on. Um, let's Let's move on to photography, shall we? All right, well, I'm, my, my two passions are underwater photography and marine biology. Mm-hmm. And I I started doing serious underwater photography in 1977 with Manaconas 2. And I bought my first housing in 1978. And I used to have a underwater photo log with number 1 to 36. Mm-hmm. And I'd take a photograph of a blue griper and I'd say, okay, that was F11 at a 60th of a second. And you wait your two weeks for your film to come back and you'd have 34 shots which go straight into the rubbish bin at a dollar a pop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you get one good one. Yeah. And you look in your log and you're all oh, right, F10, that was the one. So the next time you photographed a blue griper, you'd have, okay, I remember I was half a metre. Mm-hmm. I shot at F10 and you remember the shot. So it's like kind of like um, – like robot learning. Yeah. And so I did that and I got to the stage where I could memorise and then it became, you know, you'd say, okay, I'm going to photograph a nudie bank which is like 30 centimetres away so I know these are the settings. Mm. And you start getting results. Now, in the 70s, uh, it was 100 times harder to get good photos. Uh, and I think that's probably a fair comment. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's also a fair comment to say that underwater photography is probably the hardest type of photography apart from possibly bird photography. Yeah. Um, Because you've got so many variables, you know, surge and light problems and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you got good photographs, it was was a celebrated thing and it was was great to get them in print. So I remember my first article was uh, Night Diving on the Barrier Reef in 1983 in mm-hmm. Underwater Magazine. And I happened to get a good photograph of a green turtle at night and I was just tickled pink. I just thought, wow, I had a smile, you know, size of a telephone booth. <laughs> I thought, how good is this? Yeah. And then I started looking at magazines thinking, you know, I reckon, looked at articles, I, thought, I can do, I reckon I can do as good as that, maybe mm-hmm. better. So that kind of got me spurred on. Mm-hmm. Um, but the thing with, thing with photography is that I've got a friend who introduced me to a site called Crap Fish Photography. It's called what? Crap Fish. Yeah. 
and they celebrate bad photographs. And it's a, <laughs> it's a humorous site. It's got a lot of members. But to me, I'd rather poke myself in the eye with a fork. <laughs> I'm I'm actually going to make a note of that crap. I need to look at that. I need that in my life by the sounds of it. Because it's too easy to take bad photographs, and yeah. I still take lots of very bad photographs. <laughs> but Don't we all? The thing is, if you try and improve, um, I get this theory that because uh, I'm a bit of a constable plod, so I get this theory that. Um, I'll be a very good underwater photographer in about 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I've taken the first, so I'm, on, I'm 35 years, oh, hang on, 40, 43 years into the trek, so yep. about 10% there. Yeah. But you seem to get better and better. You seem to kind of get an understanding of composition and because um, you do it all the time. Yeah. And after a while, you look at things and you sort of take the shot and you, yeah, you kind of start getting better and better at it. You, you improve yeah. with practice. And you start getting better at judging the light and um, people talk about, oh, you know, you've got to move your strobes out when the vis is bad so you avoid backscatter. That's true to 10 or 20%. But really, the only thing you can do when the vis is bad is just get closer. If the vis is a meter, mm. you've got to shoot within probably six inches. Yeah. If you try and shoot within, say, half a metre, you're just going to get rubbish. Yeah. So moving your strobes does help to a degree, but the real fact is just get closer. And I just say to people, I wrote an underwater photography course in dive log mm -hmm. last year and the year before, and I gave away all my secrets. And um, it says the first three steps in, th most important steps in underwater photography is get closer Get mm -hmm. closer and get closer, which is what everyone says anyway. Yeah. But most divers try and photograph underwater at the beginning like they do in the backyard taking a shot of the dog. And you can't <laughs> do that because, you know, the water's so so dense. Yeah. You've got to get uh, probably three or four feet's about the maximum. And um, you've just got to get closer. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got a mate and – He's, he's going to be over the moon now. He's going to get a second mention in two episodes. I mentioned him when I was talking to Don last week. But BJ Glover, he, he does BJG Productions. He's very, very good with a camera. And he's been a cameraman since the year dot. You know, the first time I visited his house, his, his spare room was just an abundance of leads and lenses and God knows what else. But I was on his, I, I was on the trip when he decided to have a go at underwater photography for the first time. And um, it was bloody hilarious. He come up from the first dive and he's just larger than life character. Going, what? 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 What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> All that skill that he's got on, the, on, you know, above the the surface. It's just completely new skill underwater. He's nailed it now, like, but it it, it was a bit of a shocker. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there's a guy down at Shell Harbour who's oh, I think he's trying to his name. Very nice bloke, actually. Um, he's Maltese, and he's a he's been a wedding photographer in Malta, mm -hmm. and he did diving for seven years in Malta, and he's an outstanding photographer. Um, and he's made the transition because he's you know he knows a lot about. He's like a very intelligent bloke, mm. but it does take a you know a bit to get used to underwater. Yeah, but uh, anyway, there's a there's a backlog of dive logs in the uh, in the website. Mm. And people can go back and read. They're totally free. You can read, you know, how to do underwater for how to do wide angle, how to do close up, how to photograph fish. Mm. Uh, one of the things I mentioned there is that underwater photography uh, drives the dive industry. Yeah, the dive dive industry is driven by passionate people who love diving, and underwater photographers, you know, take nice photographs and it gets published in magazines, and it's a big part of driving the industry. Um, and even the people who hate fish and hate photographers, which is, <laughs> <laughs> um, they still benefit from underwater photography. Yeah. Oh, it, it changes your, um, I can remember when I changed over from, you know, I was always teaching and fun diving and God knows what else, but I never really took a camera with me. And then when I first started taking a camera, it's, it's like, oh, you know, this, this diving malarkey's just got a, 
you know, it's just stepped up a level. Yeah, it's yeah, it's rewarding. I I think getting good photographs is rewarding, and I like building up a collection of like I've got collections of uh, uh, say wrasses mm-hmm. and butterfly fish and angel fish and uh, cods and trouts and uh, damsel fish. So what I do, I when I get a good collection, I think oh, that's that's an article in that. So yeah. um, <clears throat> I've got uh, what I think is. Um, pretty unique collection of a lot of these fish families that I I don't know whether there are many um, hard-headed nutcases like me in the world <laughs> that have got, like, I've got a really good collection of um, pygmy seahorses and seahorses and sea dragons and pipefish and that. Mm. And, you know, I've got collections of stuff that um, is based on, you know, 40 years of diving mm. that, uh, that I don't know whether a lot of people in the world have got that sort of level of collections. Yeah. So I'm pretty fortunate. Um, and that, of course, leads me, naturally leads me to write an article. Oh, I'll write an article about coral trout. Yeah. And uh, you suddenly realise, oh, they're fascinating. You know, they have these amazing life cycles and you learn about them, you tell people about them and you get really good photographs and you print and, and then... No bastard reads it. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> do, you, do you bore the family at home? Or do they, are they actually interested or they just feign interest? Are they scuba divers? I've, I've got this theory that I should walk around with a, a pocket full of $10 notes and everyone I meet is a diver. I give them, I'll give you 10 bucks if you read Dive Log. <laughs> <laughs> How many um, – is it productions? Do you call it production, productions when it's a publication, digital yeah, publication? Yeah. yeah. How many have we got now? It's over 300, isn't there? Uh, we're working on 388. Nice. I've only been on board since last uh, May, so mm. we're doing our uh, seventh one now. Yeah. But I, I, I think I wrote just under 200 articles over the previous 30 years for Divelog. Wow. Um, and a, a lot of articles for sport diving and a lot of articles for scuba diver mm. when it was in Australia. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is my the start of my second year. Yeah. Just loving it? Oh, look, it's it's rewarding. Um, there's a lot of people with great energy, very passionate people, and you feed off them, and people are dynamic. They've got stories to tell or they've got... Interesting diving. Um, oh, there's a girl up the north coast, um, Lizzie, and she's she goes snorkeling at many waters, and she's she's um, does fantastic stuff. You know, yeah. photographs wobbygongs and rays and nudie breaks, and she's just really enthusiastic. Like it's a whole life. That's same as us. I mean, diving's our whole life. Yeah, and we're passionate, and you know we love it. And just being with people like that is is a, a is a great uh, joy. Oh, it's infectious, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. And uh, and you get support. I've had um, I've had some of the world's most famous photographers. I've ring, just contact them. Oh, do you want to send me in some photographs for front cover? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can't pay it. Hell right. yeah. <laughs> I've, had, I've had the world champion Renee Cavazola. Yeah, she was in the last issue, the February one. Uh, she's a wonderful photographer. Uh, um, had Tobias Friedrich, European European champion photographer, mm-hmm. sent me a fantastic article about diving in Greenland. Um, uh, David Fleetham from Hawaii. He's had like two hundred and something front cover shots. Superb wow. photographer. Uh, you should yeah. ask him if he's actually getting bored of getting front cover shots now, or if that uh, that buzz is still there after so many. Oh no, it's still there. I see him on Facebook. Yeah, and there's yeah, there's some really. Uh, we've got Gary Bell on this one on the current issue, mm-hmm. and I uh, I rank him as probably Australia's best ever underwater photographer. Wow, and I don't think a lot of people would want to argue with that. And he's got a photograph on the front cover of a leafy sea dragon. It's a beautiful shot. Oh, it's an amazing shot, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And he, he's a he's a he's another very humble, easygoing guy. You know, easy doesn't doesn't blow his own trumpet too much, but he should because he's mm. good. Mm. 
So we work with people like that who are very keen and supportive and that, that makes dive log a pleasure. Yeah. We get a few a few rebuttals. <laughs> we get ignored by a lot of people. Yeah. Well, that loss. Well, the other thing that as a controversial topic, um, we get underwater photographers, some underwater photographers are really keen to become like the world's greatest, mm-hmm. the GOAT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get on board if you give me your front cover shot. And then if you don't deliver and you say, oh, look, usually we pick it from the from an article inside. Yeah. So I had one guy and he, he got upset because I didn't put his shot in the front cover. I gave him a parting shot, a full page, yeah. and an article. And then I told him later, I said, oh, I'll give you a front cover shot. He said, oh, no. No, I was unhappy that you didn't give me a front cover shot. God, geez, I'll just bear with me. Like, I'll give you, you know, the opportunity will come. Hmm. Sometimes there's other uh, front cover photographs that happen to. I try and get a front cover shot. That leads into something inside the magazine. Yeah. Like there's a, like Don Silcock did a front cover shot of a hammer, um, a tiger shark. Yeah. And inside he had a tiger shark article from the tiger shark beach. Mm. So there was a connection. I try and make a logical sequence, but um, some photographers are very um, keen to to hit the dizzy heights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they tend to be a little bit thin skinned. They need to toughen up a bit then, don't they? You know? Um I cuz it, for me, it's it's your magazine. You know, you run the show, you decide what happens to it, and no one can dictate to you how you present that. Well, that's not true actually because I um my wife told me that I'm not allowed, I'm not allowed, to, <laughs> not allowed to have a front cover shot. And Vicky, who's our graphic agent, she said, no, no more than one a year. You're not allowed to have <laughs> So it's not entirely my choice for people to answer to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the boss of the house speaks, that's it. Yeah, so I've got to uh, – but it's, it's good because um, the more diverse – people contributing mm. the better the magazine it's not about any individual person mm. it's yeah. about the diving industry supporting the magazine and there's a lot of there's thousands of photographers in australia that say to them, like get send your photograph in well we want to publish it we want to publish if you're jay blogs from buddy you know um if you dive from alice springs and you go diving twice a year and you've got a good photograph send it in like you know yeah. Like we want to we want to publish good material, but on the other hand, I've had I had to ask a couple of people to try and improve their photos, so so they're not publishable, yes. <laughs> and that's difficult because, um, you know, I, I don't want to publish rubbish. Yeah, uh, and but you've got to try and encourage people who are enthusiastic. But at the same time, you've got to have a certain standard. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, I've had to make make that call, but that's something I don't like doing. And the same with editing. I, I don't. I try not to edit stuff. I, with editing, all I try and do is make small sentences mm-hmm. so it's easy to read yep. and more paragraphs so it's also easy to read. Yeah. That's all I try and do. Yeah. You know what you should do? Yep. Put... Um, a little competition out there with the winner getting a front cover shot. Yeah, we did. We did try competitions in the first couple of issues, and uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of extra work. And the, you know, it's, we try to get sponsors; it just didn't work. We'll try. We'll try it again. Yeah, it's a good idea. But what what's happening is that. Um, um, we basically need more support from the industry because um, uh, like some of the really big diving manufacturers, and this is going to be controversial here. Mm-hmm. So, um, We like controversy. Go for it. Well, you know, I mean, they're, they're sort of saying, oh, we're not going to advertise, and they're shutting up shop. Mm-hmm. And I just sort of say to them, well, if you won't advertise, how are people going to know that you're there? How, how, like, 
I contacted one company. I said, look, I've been a Zeagle diver. I've got Zeagle rigs, mm -hmm. Zeagle, two buoyancy Zeagle, uh, two Zeagle buoyancy vests. Mm -hmm. I said, I want to know what's happening in Zeagle. Well, I sent in the product report. Oh, no, no, we don't want to get involved. And I'm thinking, well, they really should get involved because we're reaching tens of thousands of divers and mm -hmm. I want to know what what's happened in Zeagle because I bought my Zeagle, um, what's it called, uh, concept mm -hmm. in the year 1999 and I, it actually fell apart on me under the water Last year, <laughs> 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 and the bloke I was talking to, he said, "Oh, this is hilarious! I'm a up in boys, he missed a collapse." <laughs> said, "Stay there for a while, said, bugger off." <laughs> but it did uh, well over a thousand dollars. Yeah. So I, I contacted Zeagle and said, "Mate, you're invisible hmm. in Australia. Like you let people know you're there." Yeah, because Zeagle Zeagle's an American firm, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I didn't, I'd, I'd never heard of him until. I don't know. I think it was probably about five years of living in Southeast Asia before I'd actually seen one, and it was an American dude that had one. Not very well spread over here at all. So basically, in in being controversial, I'll just say that we need the big the big manufacturers who make a lot of money out of diving hmm. need to get on board and support the diving industry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. But at the moment, I mean, could you say at the moment that, uh, you know, with, with travel restrictions the way it's going, or has been, that there's that reluctance to spend money because the income hasn't been as great? But I would expect, in saying that, just thinking out loud, I would expect that the dive industry or the local dive industry has probably increased. There are there are some dive shops who are... I've got one guy say to me from near Townsville, mm. he said, we've been busy every day last year. Mm. We've been full. Yeah. So some people are going gangbusters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got in touch with Lady Elliot. Yeah. Oh, we don't advertise. We're full till the end of the year, you know, till October. Yeah. So um, some of them are going gangbusters and some of them are doing it really tough. Like I've talked to people. It's interesting, you know, you talk to people, oh, yeah, okay, we're – we got job keeper. One guy said, "Oh, yeah, we survived on job keeper." And uh, he said, "I, I went back to uni, finished my marine biology degree." <laughs> <laughs> good on him. <laughs> so, good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> lovely stuff. Um, but yeah, there are people doing it really tough. Mm. And um, you know, uh, but I, my personal, my personal philosophy with dive log is uh, we're going to try and make it. Uh, Excellent quality hmm. with a blockbuster magazine with loads of really great reading and loads of outstanding photography. And we want people to come on board and advertise. Hmm. And then I try and tell them, stick an ad in there, it's cheap as chips, and then do an article every issue. Yeah. Just tell people, we're here, we're here, we're here. Like, for example, um, I've just done an article for um, the Solitary Islands. Yep. And um, I think this is the fourth one I've done in the last six issues mm -hmm. on diving up the North Coast. So I'm trying to boost all those dive shops. Mm -hmm. And um, But, you know, that's the way forward. The way forward is to do an ad and do lots of editorial, get people to do photos and send in a little report. So, oh, yeah, we dived at you know, Adelaide and, you know, we saw a fish and it was bloody fantastic and blah, blah, blah. Mm. Well, I think the beauty that you've got with having a digital magazine is nowadays when someone wants to travel to a particular location to dive, the first thing they do is jump online and ask, what's it like? What's the recommendations? And as soon as you do that on Facebook and, and the like, all the advice and hints and tips kind of gets lost in a lot of the posts because there's so many replies. Whereas with a digital magazine, you're getting it from the horse's mouth in an article that can't get lost in um, a conversation. It's there in, effectively, a hard copy, and you can see what you're going to be up to in that particular location. We've just got to reach people. That's, that's, that's a challenge. So I just mm. try and, like as I said, Facebook is a farce because um, they're just too greedy. Mm. And the best way is to 
use word of mouth. It's the old fashioned, you know, like the the uh, word of mouth and you know get people to sign up and get the magazine sent to your door and then mm. um, tell your friends and then you know spread the word because we we think we've got a quality magazine and we think we're producing something that um, you know. It's got a lot of stuff in there on nudie branks and photography and wrecks and um, all sorts of stuff. Adventures, great adventures, mm. dive travel and um, dive training. You know, I went into a dive shop once. I said, oh, do you have dive? Like I said, no. I said, but it advertises dive training, mm. advertises dive travel, advertises, you know, photography. It's it's a resource. You know, you use it. Mm. Oh, really? And it's free. It's free. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a marketing tool. Yeah, yeah, and a bloody good one, sir. Thank you. Um, on that note, me old mucker, we've been going for an hour and a half. Um, so I think it's about time we wrap it up and maybe have another beer before hitting the road. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm honoured. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, okay. bye. This is Scuba Go Go. Under the sea. The podcast for the inquisitive diver.